Hey, and welcome to the highlights of episode number 265 with Emily Nagoski. Now, some of my favorite parts of this episode were when she shares the two keys to a healthier and happier sex life. I also loved it when she spoke about how couples sustain a strong connection over a long period of time, what is the human giver syndrome, and how to handle different desires with your partner. But there is so much more wisdom, knowledge, and inspiration that you get in the full episode. So to listen to the full podcast and get all the info in the show notes, head on over to melissaambrosini.com forward slash 265 right now. Emily, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Well, I would love to hear about your story and how you got to where you are today doing the work that you now do. Like, how did this all unfold for you? The first thing that happened is when I got to college as an undergraduate, I was a big nerd, surprise. Um, So I knew I was going to go to grad school for something. I had no idea what, but I thought, oh, well, I need volunteer work on my resume to make me look like a good candidate for grad school, I was thinking as a first year student. Um, And so a guy on my floor suggested, hey, come be a peer health educator with me. Uh, go into residence halls and talk about like all kinds of health topics. And I was like, I like health. Sure. Uh, So I applied and I got accepted and I got trained to go into residence halls and talk about contraception, condoms and consent, basically. So I started my work as an undergrad sex educator, my very first semester in college. Uh, And then the other thing that happened is that over the years of my undergrad, I got a degree in psychology with minors in cognitive science and philosophy, uh, which I genuinely do use. And I love the brain stuff. I had this plan to be a clinical neuropsychologist. I was going to work with people with traumatic brain injury and stroke. But as much as I love the academic work and the intellectual stuff, it just, the work I was doing as a sex educator and then as a sexual violence prevention educator, and then as a sexual assault crisis responder, that work made me like who I am as a person. In a way, the the work I was doing as a sex educator, sexual violence prevention educator, and then as a sexual violence crisis responder made me like who I am as a person in a way that the intellectual academic stuff just never could. So that's the path I chose. And so I was like, okay, so I have this clinical background, but I'm not going to be a therapist. So let me keep going to school. So I got a PhD basically in public health and became a sex educator. I got a job at Smith College, which is a small liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts. So after this really demanding semester, the last question on my final exam was, out of all this science, just tell me one important thing you learned. And out of my 187 students, more than half of my students just wrote something like, I learned I'm normal. Just because I'm different from other women doesn't mean I'm broken. I can trust my body because my body is normal. And that's the day I decided to write Come As You Are. A mere four and a half years later, it was published as a book. I would love to hear, you know, you talk about these keys to healthier and happier sex lives. So what are they? The most basic level, the two keys to your best sex life, the keys are confidence and joy. Confidence is knowing what is true about your body, about the world, about your sexuality, even when it's not what you were taught was supposed to be true, even when it's not what you wish were true. Confidence is knowing what is true about you in the world. And joy is the hard part. Joy is loving what's true about you, even when it's not what you were taught to expect to be true, even when it's not what you wish were true. Loving what's true about your body, your sexuality, and your place in the world, being able to find joy in whatever it is that is you, is the fundamental, am I going to say guarantee of a spectacular sex life? I don't know if I'm going to say guarantee, but it's a It's pretty difficult not to have a great sex life if you really love and value your body the way it is. So for people who are in long-term relationships, how do we sustain that strong sexual connection 
over that long term? You know, you talk about these two important Mm -hmm. ways that we can do that. Yes. When you look at the research on couples who do sustain a strong sexual connection, who self-identify as having extraordinary sex lives, what they tell us is the thing that helps them is not the things we usually see in movies. So it's not about having like a spontaneous craving for sex of like really desiring sex all the time. That is not what they say their sex lives are like. They are not even people who have sex very often. Hardly any of us are having sex very often. We have a lot of other things we need to get done. And so there's only a limited amount of time we can invest in sex. And they're not couples who are necessarily having what we might think of as like wild adventurous sex. They instead are couples who have two things in common. First, they have a strong foundation of trust in their relationship. They're really good friends. And in sexuality, the trust is really important because, I mean, geez, you're going to be potentially taking off some clothes and letting them see parts of your body almost no one else will see. You've got to really know that person is going to be emotionally accessible, responsive, and engaged with you. So trust is really essential. And the other component is, man, when you think about it, it's so obvious. They prioritize sex. They decide that it matters for their relationship, that they're willing to stop everything else and just do that. So what this looks like in practice is that they set up times to have sex. They know, you know, Saturday at three o'clock, you, me, in the red underwear. Totally. But for someone listening who is thinking, yeah, but I don't trust my partner. Like, where to from there? Like, I don't feel safe with them. Yeah, that's a really fundamental issue. It's not a sexual problem. It is a relationship difficulty. And the solution for it does not lie in any kind of sexual contact you can have. The the sex has to emerge in response to the trust. So if you don't trust your partner to be there for you, you definitely can't trust them to be there for you for sex. Why would you? What about for someone who, you know, you spoke about prioritizing it, and that's something that's really important in my partnership. And what if someone listening is like, well, I want to prioritize it, but my partner's not really interested. So where to from there? Oh, you want to talk about a crystal clear conversation you can have with someone. I really recommend that partners with higher desire and partners with lower desire think through the answer to the question, what is it that I want when I want sex? If you're going to prioritize sex, what is it that sex brings to your relationship? It's not just orgasm. You can have an orgasm by yourself. You do not need the other person to be there for that. So what is it that sex contributes to your relationship. And when people can be clear and honest with themselves first about, like they can get past, I'm thinking here of men in particular, because they're trapped in this really sick set of cultural messages. First of all, that they're only allowed to express and receive love through sexual touch. To simply be affectionate and loving is unmasculine, unmanly, and They can't get access to love unless they can get access to sex. And if their partner is just not up for sex for whatever reason, it feels like their partner is rejecting their whole manhood, their entire identity as a masculine person. And the other really destructive message is that we tell men that their value can be measured by their ability to get their penises into the vaginas. In the second book, Burnout, which I wrote with Amelia, We invented this phrase, human giver syndrome. It comes from uh, this work by the Australian moral philosopher, Kate Mann. She wrote a book called Down Girl, which I recommend so highly. It's pretty dark, but nice and short. So if you've got the emotional wherewithal, I really recommend it. So human giver syndrome is the idea that there are two kinds of humans in the world. There's the human beings who have a moral obligation to be and express their full humanity and should be as competitive, acquisitive, and entitled as it takes in order to be their full humanity. And uh, then on the other hand, we've got the human givers who have a moral obligation to give their full humanity to the human beings, their time, attention, their patience, their kindness, their love, their bodies, their hopes and dreams, even their lives sacrificed on the altar of someone else's comfort and convenience. At the cultural level, the scripts we have received 
are that women are supposed to give their bodies to men as a sacrifice so that men can be the fully developed human beings that they are supposed to be. This message lives really deeply in our body. Is there a ideal amount of time per week that we could be prioritizing lovemaking for? Like, I mean, in all your research, like, have you come across anything that says, because I know some couples that have not made love in months and months and months and months and even years. When you do read the research about like how frequently couples have sex or anything else like that, okay, so that can give you a description of what a population of people said about their sex lives. But does what those people say about their sex lives have anything to do with you, your body, your relationship, your sexuality? And yet, if I were to like say a number about like how many times people report having sex, it would be literally impossible for a person to hear that number and not compare their frequency of sex or whatever, and then judge themselves as being either right or wrong, good or bad. If I say that number, then if a couple it, it has differential desire, which is the most frequent sexual difficulty that couples take into sex therapy, where one partner wants sex more than the other, come to a decision about what sex is right for them, not by looking out to any numbers, but by turning their attention inward to what their own body and heart says. I think that's really important. Everybody is different. And I know many couples who have different, you know, one person wants it more than the other and their relationships are thriving and they've been together for many, many years. So it doesn't mean that just because someone in the relationship wants it or desires it more than the other, that your relationship is faulty. Oh, heck no. And when couples can be really clear with each other about what it is that they want when they want sex, uh, so that they're also really clear about what's being turned down when a person turns down sex, like I'm just turning down genital contact and arousal right now. I love the heck out of you. And like, I totally want to pay attention to you and hug you. And I'm touched out from the children today. And so can we just lie here and talk like grownups? That's not turning down the person, it's not turning down the love. It's just like my body is not where it could be to make sex happen right now. Now, I want you to talk to us about unwanted arousal. Oh, yeah. Yes, please. You have a special name you call it. So the technical term for it is arousal non-concordance, which sounds real fancy and intimidating, but non-concordance just means that there is a mismatch between what's happening in your physiology and what's happening in your subjective experience of pleasure and desire. And it happens in every emotional and motivational system that we have, including sex. My favorite non-sex example is actually a study of music. You know the feeling of uh, goosebumps or you get chills, chills run down your spine? The physiological marker for that is called piloerection. It's where your hair stands on end. So they did a study where they found out that there are certain songs that predictably produce chills. For example, My Heart Will Go On or uh, Purple Rain. And they played this music to research subjects. And they literally just had a camera watching the hair on a person's arm. And they watched whether or not their hair stood on end. And then they asked them the question, hey, did you get chills? when you were listening to it. And it turns out there is not a significant relationship between whether a person says they got chills from the music and whether their hair stood on end. This is an example of arousal non-concordance, a mismatch between a person's subjective experience and their physiological response. But if you are Celine Dion, which matters to you? Do you want people to walk out of the theater going, eh, it was fine, but their hair stood on end? Or do you want them to walk out of the theater going, oh, I got chills. It was amazing. And who cares what their hair was doing, right? Like, obviously, it's the person's subjective experience that matters. And we're really good at understanding that it's the subjective experience that matters until we learn that this also applies to sex. So instead of it being about pilo erection, it's just about erection, erection. It's about blood flow to the genitals. It turns out there is not necessarily a significant correlation between what a person's blood flow is doing and how a person subjectively feels. And we live in a world where somehow people who are perfectly capable of understanding that 
if you feel like you got chills, you got chills, regardless of what your hair did, they sort of can't wrap their heads around the idea that like, it doesn't matter if a person's vagina is wet. It doesn't matter if their penis is erect. If they're like, meh, this isn't working for me. When a person says it's not working for them, no matter what their genital blood flow is doing, you believe the person. The subjective experience is definitely right. I would never like bite into a apple and find out it's got a worm in it, but my mouth still waters. And people would be like, well, you just don't admit how much you like that wormy apple, Emily, because my physiological response happened. Such an important point. And I can see how important this is to talk to our children about. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, it. I feel sort of angry when... <laughs> I hear people say, I've never heard of this before because this research has existed since the early 80s. And even in the early 80s, researchers were warning within their research papers, let's make sure we're not mistaking res genital response for pleasure or desire. And it took 18 is when I did my TED Talk, 40 years it has taken for this idea to even begin penetrating into the mainstream. And the reason these ideas are so slow to make their way into the mainstream is because we don't talk about it, because just bringing up the whole subject makes people go, ee, ah! even just get, like I had to fight Ted pretty hard to let me give this talk because it was so like I used the word clitoris. I talked about blood flow to the genitals and the people at Ted were like, I don't know if this is right for us. And I was like, well, this is the talk I'm going to give. So let's let's work it. Let's make it happen. And they were really supportive and helped me write my talk in a way that wasn't going to freak people out too much. But like, it's difficult to talk about. And it takes a really deliberate effort to make sure you have the conversation with people in your life. And we need to be having it in... Okay. So part of the research I had to read for writing Come As You Are is I read Fifty Shades of Grey. How would you approach talking about this to teenage children? Because I know a lot of my listeners would have kids. How do we open up this dialogue with them? Yeah, actually, the most important thing, it's not so much about the precise words you say. The main thing is being able to modulate your body's own reaction to these ideas and saying these words and having the conversation. I will give you a, a negative example and then a positive example. The negative example is my own family. My mom, who's great. The first time I ever asked her, we were in the car driving home from the library. I must have seen the word vagina in a book at the library because we're sitting in the car and I say, hey, mom, what's a vagina? And I don't remember what she said, but I remember the huge flash of just embarrassment and horror. And whatever this vagina thing was, it was not something I should ever bring up ever again, ever. So the more you can work on making sure your emotional response to ideas around sexuality is neutral. And it, if I had asked, hey, mom, what's, what's an elbow? What does axillary mean? Oh, it just means armpit. Like if your emotional response can be the same to a question like, what's the technical word for an armpit? Or what's a philtrum? Oh, it's that divot between uh, the, the top part of your lip and your nose. If your emotional reaction to that is the same as your emotional reaction to sex-related words and ideas, you're going to be doing just fine. The second part of it is you have to be willing to be the parent who receives the, ugh, mom, gross. Like they, they don't want to hear it from you. <laughs> They're not going to, you didn't want to hear it from your parents, but it is your job to show up and be the one who says, hey, listen, condoms, let's talk about it. Hey, your genitals are a normal part of your body. So my positive counterexample comes from a therapist who participated in a training of mine. This was a few years ago. And she's like, I just have to tell you this story about my daughter from when she was two. She was on uh, a bouncy ball. Does Australia have bouncy balls, little like handle balls and you like bounce up and down on them? Yes. So two-year-old girl on a bouncy ball and the little girl goes, hey, mommy, this feels really good. <laughs> and the mom says, yes, honey, that's your clitoris. And the little girl says, my clitoris is my favorite. 
that story brings me so much joy and gives me so much hope for the future. Because we know at least this one human is being raised to know that her body belongs to her, all of it. 